of ground where there's no more room for burials and there's fewer and fewer direct mourners, what do you do with this piece of land? Because um, there's many people who just happily built houses on it. Um, and this is our dilemma. What makes this place important and what makes this place valuable? Um, of course, um, I think it's more than just the dustbin of the dead. I think this place is very important that the dead should rest in peace. The trouble is, I have very few solid uh, economic arguments to back that up. I think that's just right, and having a feeling about something is quite difficult to argue when somebody has legal precedent behind them. Um, but, of course, this place is more than just a dustbin of the dead, like I say. It's um, a garden of remembrance. It's a place to wander, it's a place to enjoy the birds, it's a place to enjoy the wildlife and enjoy the wonderful uh, built heritage as well. But also a place to remember death. Uh, if that's not too morbid, uh, not just our own ancestors, but death in general. And that's the whole Victorian ideal of this place, is that you should come in here on a Sunday afternoon and remember your ancestors and remember that we all died to lead a good life while you're at it. So um, keep in mind that you go to Victoria Park to play football if you want to. You come here to have a quiet uh, walk in the sunshine. So this is a park uh, by a different means. Uh, the history of the cemetery, very briefly, in 1851, the state of St Mary's Churchyard in town was horrific, which led to the formation of the Friends of Wendon Road Cemetery, no, the formation of the Wendon Road Cemetery, and then in 2010, the horrific state of the Wendon Road Cemetery led to the formation of the Friends of Wendon Road Cemetery. Uh, this place fell into severe decline after the 1940s and 50s, and it's only really uh, in the last decade or so that that, reversed, that that neglect has started to be reversed. What happened was in 2008 there was the big jam factory over there, Old Gerber Foods. That had been decommissioned and was being converted into houses. And attention turned onto this adjoining place about what to do. This place was full of brambles. The neighbours there had just seen off several waves of antisocial behaviour of kids coming in here, smashing things, uh, getting drunk and, and doing drugs, of course. Um, so um, attention turned to what to happened to here. One of the ideas that was quite possible was that all the memorials would be swept away. Uh, and possibly more. Uh, and so that's why the Friends formed to um, uh, basically do something about this neglect. I first came in here in 2008 because of this to record what was here, just to make a note of everything before it was lost. Uh, and of course one thing led to another. Um, so in terms of how it could be lost, some of you may wonder if that was likely. I mean this place is huge. Surely you can't dig up the dead, you can't uh, get rid of all the memorials, but it does happen and Bridgewater has quite a disgraceful history of doing that. And a disgraceful recent history as well. This isn't when we look at Bridgewater and we see all the horrific 1960s kind of grotty buildings and we think that all the dangers are in the past. In 2001, the uh, Catholic uh, burial ground in Gordon Terrace was dug up. Uh, the, there was a brief archaeological investigation, but the rest of it was done away with. In about the same time, in Fryan Street, the uh, old Unitarian burial ground under the uh, armory was dug up, and across the road, in the la it was either last year or the year before, the old Zion Chapel was dug up and done away with, and that's been turned into houses. So the only difference here is it's slightly bigger, but the same principles apply. Eventually, you just leave it to neglect. You sweep away the memorial so nobody remembers what's here, you let it get overgrown, you restrict access, and then eventually you just sell it off to a developer who pays to have it excavated and then makes a lot more money by turning it into houses. This isn't necessarily deliberate, I'm not saying anyone set out to do that, but it's just a process by increment. Um, so how do we stop that happening? Because that's exactly what happened at the Scion Chapel site, there were Victorian stones like a lot of the ones you'll see today, and they've just been lifted up and done away with. So, um, how do we stop the neglect? How do we preserve it? How do we protect it? Is it worth preserving? I think it is. You may all disagree with me. I assume you're not because you're here today. So, um, this is why the Friends form. Now, when we started working in the cemetery, there were no protections on this place at all. Uh, the council could have done away with everything. All they had to do was put a notice in the newspaper in the small advertisements and then leave it a couple of months and as long as nobody protested, they could just come in here and start the process. So one of the first things we did was to have this memorial listed. Here it is, here's the original design. And you can see it was originally painted at the top there. This is the memorial to James Cook, who was the town clerk of Bridgewater in the 19th century. Uh, he was an incredible chap who left a lot of money to lots of important institutions around the town. 
He was very instrumental in bringing a fresh water supply to Bridgewater and helping with the legal negotiations around the Wendland Reservoir. Um, what's important about this, though, as important as he is, this memorial is incredibly important. You can see the date on it is 1911. Now, we think of Victorian cemeteries, and you'll see some huge memorials and grand mausoleums later. By 1911, that tradition had died out. The thing with this being 1911 is this is the sort of memorial which was typical at the time. This whole section here was originally a garden laid out in uh, the sort of Victorian manner. Here's the view as it would have been if you stood here looking that way. You can see the chapels. You can see this bit of ground was a garden. So this was all laid out in the 1910s, 1920s for memorials. So this is your sort of standard humble thing. Whereas instead in 1911 they built this whopper. The thing about this is this is the bridge between 19th century big tombs and if you think in 1914 the First World War happened, and you've got the memorials to the First World War dead in front of us here, is this became the model of uh, war memorials and town cenotaphs. I know this is different from the one in Bridgewater. You think there's all the towns and villages across Britain have a war memorial of some sort. This is the bridge to it, and this is the sort of forerunner of it. And this is why this is list now listed grade two. The other reason this is listed grade two is, uh, well, the importance of this being listed grade two is it means it's protected, it can't be changed without legal process. It means the owner of the site is liable for repairs, which is Central District Council, which we accidentally foisted on them. Uh, so if this falls into any trouble, they're the ones who have to fix it. The other thing is the setting is protected as well. So because this is nationally important, its setting has to be protected and preserved, which means this section of the cemetery is now preserved by process. So this is one thing to keep in mind here. There's a couple of things before we move on here. Um, one is the gates over there. You can see those are pretty grotty. I hate those gates. Uh, even though uh, Dave Webb there did an awful lot of work a few years ago fixing them after a car drove into them. Uh, the original gates look like this. They're a grand sort of graphic thing. And you can see they're white as well, or possibly mauve or pink or something. And black gates for cemeteries is a 20th century thing, so the Victorians like a bit of colour in their cemeteries. Um, one of the things in the medium to long term I'd like to do is replace those, and something the friends might like to do is replace them. We haven't decided on this yet. The idea is we could put the design out to competition, uh, and we can have something that, not necessarily a copy of the past, but something that is uh, not necessarily modern, but something that is grander, architectural, a good piece of design for Bridgewater, which can attract attention from the Wendon Road and be something the town can be proud of. The other thing to point out here is, you can see the lovely angel over there. Next to that is a black tombstone next to the gates. That is a modern tombstone, which was put up a couple of years ago by the Cooperative Funeral Care of Bridgewater. They wanted to help us out, um, and uh, they said, well, we've got a couple of tombstones, what do you want them for? Uh, you'll see the other one later, but we thought it would be nice to have a tombstone by the main gate, because there's no sign on the gates of what on earth this place is or any of the history of it. So we thought a tombstone saying Bridgewater Cemetery, opened 1851, closed 1985, would be appropriate. And now anyone walking past can see what this place is, and um, it's something quite fitting with the rest of the place. The only other thing, there's a small picture here, I'm not sure you can all see it. This was the Cook Memorial when we came in 2010. And this tree was all the way over here and there was a tree growing out the top of it. You can see, that's the best of it here. So this was in a dire state and it was being pushed apart. So our intervention has saved this for a good number of decades. We'll walk on, then you've got the centre one over there and over there. So it comes along here, up to there, and then sort of zips across that way. Uh, unfortunately, there's no neat line across the cemetery. It's a zigzag all the way over, but they were both run separately and each of them had their own little chapel. So here stood the Anglican one, which is this building here. Uh, it's a glorious Gothic thing. It's designed by a man called Braxbeer, who uh, restored in inverted commas St. Mary's Church. He, he did a hatchet job on St. Mary's Church. He destroyed a lot of good material there. But this is an absolute wonder, and this is, is a glorious thing, and there's nothing else like it in terms of cemetery chapel design. It's, uh, the top is based on Glastonbury Abbott's chap kitchen chapel. Hang on. The, Abbott's Kitchen at Glastonbury, thank you. Because uh, it's got a lantern roof, and the bottom is like a chapter house, an octagonal chapter house. And you can still see one like that on St John's Church in Eastover. So if you go there, you can see something a bit like this. So 
Uh, this mound represents his location. The story goes that in the 70s, uh, the Vicar of St Mary's just offered the materials here to any builder who wanted to come in and take them away, demolish it, but he'll get the stone. You'll also see going up that way and in houses around here, lots of uh, this sort of white bath stone. And basically, uh, once it was rubble, people came by and helped themselves to uh, stone for their rockery. So there is a fair bit of this kicking around. Um, it didn't... This is a glorious picture that only showed up this year. But you can see the lantern had to be taken down at one point because it was slightly over-engineered. Um, and so it was a much simpler building. Um, one of the major problems with the cemetery today is there's no great focus of attention. It's a, you can, especially today, it's looking lovely. You can wander around. It's like any country churchyard. But with country churchyards, you've got a church or something in the middle to build up to, or an old chapel or something, whereas here, you've got memorial upon memorial upon memorial. You haven't got any sort of focus to sort of orbit round. So, um, I mean, even the Bronze Age had um, standing stones and things. So we really need some sort of architectural focus in here as a sort of planning aspect. And one of the things we've, we've chatted about doing with this we don't really know what's under this mound, and uh, Harry Frost, our advisor, suggested this might make a lovely raised garden. So what we'll do is dig this out, record what's there, have uh, the footprint of the octagonal chapel raised up to about, you know, about waist height. So a uh, wheelchair can be brought in up to there, into here, into the old chapel, and then there's gardens all the way around. And maybe if we find a fair bit of decent, usable rubble, we can build, rebuild a window or something. So this is one idea we could do here. It'd be a fair bit of work, but it could be a good little project for anyone who wants to do it. So um, you'll also see there's uh, some sketches for that in the booklet we've designed. Now, uh, there's a couple more things to point out here. We will go over there in just a moment, but there's one, that memorial there, with the urn on top of it. That records the Lot family. Um, it's quite a neat little thing. You can see the urn on top, that, for some reason, was taken off at one point. And so that was just laying on the ground when we came here in 2010. Uh, fine memorials are in here one day with the gantry putting this one up, so they just popped it back on for us for a, uh, a bit of pocket money, and that was it. The thing to note with that one isn't actually the memorial itself. You can see the curb below it, and you can see that there's the uh, little, little pointy things where the old railings would have been. That had actually collapsed. And so the vault below it had collapsed, the brick vault had gone, the memorial was sound, that was still in situ. But there was a huge kind of pit where all the earth had fallen in. So the Friends volunteers spent weeks, absolutely weeks, digging out the remains of the curbs, building it up, cementing the curbs back into place, and then eventually putting gravel and chippings down. Um, so it looks like it's always been like that now, but there's months of work gone into that, an awful lot of hard graph. Basically, with this sort of whole section, you can see this section is more or less, more or less done now. This section is still a lot to do, and the whole cemetery, there's a lot to do eventually. What happens is first, the friends come in, the friends volunteers tidy it up. Fine memorials will come in and lift stones where they need to be. So most of these you see standing are actually uh, fine memorials, putting this one up, all these, all these have been put back up again. The friends then have to tidy up the sections, uh, weed everything around them, put the curbs right, so the friends volunteers cement the curbs back together, although I think these two were done by fine memorials. And then uh, membrane is laid down, and then these chippings are put in place. These chippings come from up the road at Cannington Quarry. Uh, they're not like the little glassings you see in uh, lots of modern cemeteries which come all the way from China. These come from Upper Road. I think they look quite nice, and it's nice and sustainable, and it's local as well. And um, it's quite cheap as well, which is fantastic. The chapel, <laughs> and this effective. was what we call, I think, is this section one or section four? It was the bottom of the oh. pile anyway. <laughs> section one. So the cheapest burial and the cheapest memorials. The section in the middle here was um, the pauper's burial ground. So those are for the people too poor or uh, unable to afford their own burials. And their communal graves paid for by the parish. So up to 10 people could be buried in a single plot. They'll dig a pit uh, and then wait a couple of weeks, a couple of months. They'll just cover it over with boards and then add people on top of each other, no relation to each other, and um, just piled in. And no memorials either. So one of the things we've had done is had uh, the black memorial, uh, wherever it's gone, over there, erected. That was the second one by the property funeral care. 
Uh, and so that the intention behind that is so the people without a memorial can have a memorial. So anyone who is um, descended from the paupers who are buried here can come in and lay flowers. We only have partial records of where people are buried in the pauper section. We know about four or five plots, maybe up to 20 or so, but most of them are just in here somewhere. We don't exactly know where. This strip along the path here, the uh, Friends volunteers a couple of years ago were preparing this section along the wall here for a new paper road. Uh, and while they were in there, they actually stumbled across a pile of old memorials. And here's a few pictures, and they are actually under there. They're under there, they've, they've been lined up away from the head. But um, there are a mass of them just done. And so the Friends volunteers spent ages digging them out, recording them all, and lining them up neatly. You can see the volunteers put an awful lot of effort using the uh, Stonehenge or, or pyramid technique of rolling the stones out. And that was, uh, this was into December that year. They were discovered about September time, normally when the Friends give up for the year. Uh, but that year they found these, so they just plowed on through through the bad weather, um, finding all the memorials and recording them all so we know what was there. Um, what's happening with the rest of this place is you can see it's cordoned off, and you can see the little flowers poking through. Um, what's happening here is the friends are experimenting with a wild flower medal. So this is a trial section. The idea is that this section, and then we'll have the original path, and maybe the section over here will be wild flower meadows to mark where the old burial plots were. Um, so Central District Council gave us 4,000 wild flower plugs last year and they were planted for us partially by the volunteers but we had the Sedgemore Conservation volunteers in to um, help us. Now this is partially to help the world's bee crisis but long grass and um, flowers of this sort help insects. Insects provide feed for birds and birds are just nice, you can hear them. Uh, today. So there used to be a massive bramble patch all along here, all the way around. You can just see where the grass is a bit taller there and there's a few uh, bits there. You couldn't get in there and there's a couple of memorials still standing there and they were in the middle of the bramble pit. So the Friends volunteers have cleared all of this, um, recorded the memorials. And so this section is a wild flower meadow. That section under the trees there is now planted as a bluebell wood. You can go over there and see a few bluebells in later years once they've, um, um, what's the word? Thank you, established themselves. Uh, it should look quite pretty come this time of year. Uh, the last thing to note is that massive tree in the middle there. Uh, that's a massive holm oak. Uh, we've uh, done the calculations of, of, of uh, measuring the trunk and doing this special formula you can get online. That was planted in about 1800 and it's probably the oldest thing in the cemetery, apart from a few of the, the, the people there. That was buried 51 years before the cemetery was founded. It was buried about, it was planted about 15 years before the Battle of Waterloo. That tree has seen the coming and going of the jam factory on the other side. And when that was planted, that was just a field boundary when all this was just meadowland. So it's incredibly important. Sedge Royal District Council are coming in to lop it back because it's causing a bit of problems for the houses on the far side. But it's just worth noting that that's um, quite an important piece of local history, that tree. I adore that tree. Um, <laughs> but I would. Um, and this we'll walk over there. These three were done last year. These two were done this year. What happened is here, the friends hacked back the brambles initially. And then this section here, we were very lucky to have a very generous donation from a Mr. and Mrs. Fisher from London, who were descended from the people buried in this one here. This chap wanted uh, this memorial repair because it's his ancestors, but his ancestor was best friends with the chap buried at this one, so he wanted this one done well. And also because this one was a mess, he said, well, this one should really be done, so it's a neat row. The money he gave us allowed us to also repair these two. So we've got a complete row here. And if you look closely, you can see the crack on that one. You can see cracked on on here. This one was in three pieces, and again, this one. So all of these were in a terrible state. And so an awful lot of work has been going on to put these right. And the friends have done an awful lot of work putting the curbs right. So the descendants of people buried in this cemetery are now spread all over the world. And we are contacted by people in Canada, New Zealand, Australia, South Africa, and America. Uh, I think the furthest to field, uh, the most uh, exotic was Singapore once and they all want to look there for their ancestors. They can find them online. Membership of the Friends and their donations so they can uh, find pictures of their ancestors helps towards repair and it brings money into the cemetery. 
Our website has most of the records relating to the cemetery on it, but you have to be a member in order to access them. None of us are hugely, hugely keen to make charge people for accessing their own history. But on the other hand, because we have these records, it means people are encouraged to become members, which provides membership fees, which we can then use to um, put towards this sort of work, although this was a private donation. Um, so the friends have earmarked that one with a couple of angels on it uh, for repair, and there's a few more as we go on that way, which we'll point out. So the Friends are reasonably healthy in terms of membership because we have an international membership of a, almost a couple of hundred people now. The trouble is what we desperately need are volunteers and active, commi and active committee members to put all of this into action. The Friends volunteers have been uh, fantastic but they started out as a group of about 12 to 15 which has slowly dwindled to about four people at the moment. So we are uh, near the bone in terms of where we are. It's not helped that I live in Scotland and so get out of most of the hard work most of the time. Although I will be in here tomorrow uh, helping out, so you will see me uh, actually doing work for a change. Um, <laughs> and we will be working over there, I'm, I'm told. Uh, one other thing to point out here is behind this hedge here, which looks quite pretty at the moment, this is what we really want all the way around. You can see the hedgerow there. We're not so keen on the palisade fencing like that. We'd rather have hedges because the green setting for the memorials is much prettier. Behind that hedge is a green metal fence which was put up by Sedgemoor District Council. Um, that wasn't, we did ask them for it and they just went ahead and did it, which was wonderful. Uh, they have been incredibly helpful to us uh, while we've been going and they put their money in there with their mouth is in supporting us, in giving us all sorts of help where, where they can. So with the wildflower plugs over there, in letting us just get on with things, not giving us uh, massive amounts of red tape whenever we want a memorial for that. So um, that palisade fence actually looks quite nice now when you're coming up the lane. There was a horrible sort of chicken wire repair there a few years ago. And also the other thing to point out is these lovely trees. Uh, we've got a bit of a void here at the moment. We've put two in here and would like uh, three. Have I missed one? Oh yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, oh, there we go. Uh, that one there is uh, dedicated by the Mayor of Bridgewater, Stephen Stella Austin, from a couple of years ago. But eventually the greenery will come back. We've cut back an awful lot of brambles, which were destroying a lot of the heritage, but we do want to put back to encourage the wildlife. So we've had about 10 bird and bat boxes put up as well throughout the cemetery. Birds are important, as are bats. Uh, the difference with this one compared to the Anglican one, though, is that that one has no burials underneath it. This one has a whole vault underneath it, a big vault and roughly like that and that's based on the original design because of the vault though there's not a huge amount we can do with this mound so that one we can dig out we can find what's there with this one we don't know how structurally sound it is we don't know how uh, much has been filled in so there's not a huge amount we can do with it in terms of planning and forward planning one of my ideas is that we could maybe take the memorials which are slowly slipping and because the water is getting onto them and they're doing them no good at all, these should be inside. I've wondered if we could maybe put them against the wall over there and have some sort of memorial wall uh, with buttresses and any sort of remains we could find and maybe turf this over. We'll leave it turned over or we'll make it more of an impressive mound. Trouble is we can't build on it, we can't flatten it to make a sort of, uh, a sort of uh, green to have uh, uh, talks on or anything because again we don't know how stable it is. Um, we do have a story that apparently a couple of years ago the council mower was on top of it cutting grass and fell in. Um, so this sort of gives you some idea um, of how dangerous it is. Uh, we do have a couple of pictures of how it looked in later years. We were sent this a couple of years ago from over there and we think this tree here is actually that one as it is now. So you can see the huge difference between the two of them. And this is the chapel in the background which is covered. The last year we also had this one which shows that in his last few years, and you can see the window's been destroyed, this wall has collapsed, and it's falling to pieces, but that's the way it goes. It's a shame, because it was a lovely chapel. There's no point in the Friends rebuilding it, because we've got no real use for one. Another thing to point out here is the lovely angel there, the Simmons Memorial, uh, which again was smashed to pieces a couple of years ago, and has been repaired, and she's been, she was in half, and she's been put back together now. We're not sure whether it's worth putting the railings back on that one. It does look a bit bare without them, but we're not sure. You can see the board memorial a bit better there. There's another angel over there for the Bowering family. Because the Bowering family sounds familiar. They're the ones with the big factory by the docks. You've got uh, the lilies on that one there. 
which is the Carver family, and they were the ship, um, shipyard owners on uh, East Key. So the great and the good of Victoria Bridgewater are in this section. We'll when was Thursday this was finished? Yes. Yep, Thursday. <laughs> so these are the Friends Volunteer. This is uh, Andy, Alan and Dave. And you can see the uh, joins they put back together, the curbs which have fallen down. They put chippings in this one. An awful lot of work has gone into these two, and this is the most recent work. The other thing to point out here is this memorial. It does look a bit inside the children here. And another part of the Friends activities is the side of research. Research provides genealogical help for the worldwide membership and it provides content for the website. Both encourage membership, both encourage membership fees, and that the fees rate for researching things pays for the chippings and things and these sort of things. Um, so the point I stop at this one in particular, because this is a very recent discovery, you can see this lady here, Isabella Metford. Last year I bought a copy of uh, Jarman's History of Bridgewater from 1889. Inside that History of Bridgewater are a lot of handwritten annotated notes. In the front of it is her name and she had written her memories of Bridgewater uh, from being a child and growing up and there's, um, there's about 30 pages since I've transcribed them of her memories of Bridgewater. Not only does this make her the first female historian of Bridgewater, looking into her life, her family are Quakers, she's a niece of the Clarks family, so Clark shoemakers, um, but was also Thomas Clark, who was John Clark, who lived in Eastover, who was an inventor, who invented the Macintosh coat, uh, so she was related to them, but she was incredibly important in her own right. She was an anti-slavery campaigner and travelled all around Europe on that cause and throughout the British Empire. But more importantly, she's Bridgewater's first uh, advocate of women's suffrage. So with her sister, Wilhelmina, uh, she signed the first petition to give women the votes. So we have here just a very recent piece of research and Bridgewater's first uh, feminist and female historian, which is quite amazing when you think about it. I'm hoping to get her notes and her, an account of her life published in the next year. But this sort of shows you some of the wonders this cemetery has to show. And if all the memorials were taken away, that's all lost, in right theory. So the uh, whole section was just filled with brambles. Um, there's a few important uh, memorials on here. First of all, at the back there, because of the brambles, we had no idea there was that slab. You can just see by the wall there. That records uh, William Thomas Holland. If that name's familiar to you, any of you who've looked on the side of the bridge in town will have seen the name, because he was mayor of Bridgewater when the bridge was open. Uh, that memorial was a, basically a 45 degree angle when we first came in here, because it had, um, uh, the, the subsidence, subsidence? Yeah. Uh, had basically made it meant the Baltic collapse, and it was in a terrible state. So Ward Councillor Jill Slocum very kindly offered us the money to put that right. And so five memorials came in here, lifted it up and sorted out for us again. You wouldn't know anything's ever happened to that one, but an awful lot of work has gone into it. Um, that memorial there is incredibly special. That just looks like a pile of rocks. Uh, so it could just be a builder who's dumped things here, but actually if you look closer, there's names on it and there's a vault underneath it. That is, uh, records members of the Spiller family. There was a chap called Joel Spiller who founded a very important grain business, which is still in operation. Uh, they now make Winnelot dog biscuits, among many other more important <laughs> things. But uh, the daughters he had were also incredible philanthropists about the town. That memorial is incredibly weird. Um, there's nothing else like it in Britain. It takes the form of a prehistoric burial cairn. I have scoured um, many sort of cemeteries and mausoleum databases to find anything like that at all. But there's nothing else like it. Uh, once we found it, there was a legend that apparently they believed that the soul couldn't get out of the ground and so they needed some sort of vent to get out of. I'm not sure I believe that or not. But it is quite an important thing. And because we got the Cook Memorial listed before we dug that out, we haven't had a chance to get that listed yet. So that's something we must do, because it is of national importance and quite a wonderful thing. Um, the other one here is this Brig Memorial, which is for the Brown family. Uh, the Browns were brick and tile manufacturers, but there's also a chap here buried called uh, George Lewis Brown. It was uh, Lord Nelson's flag captain at the Battle of Trafalgar. There's a famous story about Nelson raising the flags, England expects every man to do his duty. He originally wanted, uh, I think it sounded like Britain confides to every man. Uh, and it was this chap, George Lewis Brown, who said, I can't really do that with flags, but I can make it England expects. So that's where that came from. That's this chap here. Uh, this vault had actually collapsed a few years ago. If you have a close look at it, this slab is actually concrete 
Whereas a couple of these, the original Bath Stone, what had happened is it more or less collapsed. And I think it's AB Memorials in Bridgewater who spent a lot of work uh, putting this back up. English Heritage didn't list this one because it is uh, old and new repairs. Uh, and of course, concrete, it isn't original. But uh, apparently, AB Memorials in town have a uh, drawer in which they have the original big key for the vault. Uh, the door for the vault has been blocked up. Um, there's a couple more things to point out here. Um, in the corner is that little hedge there, behind the tree. Well, there's a couple of trees we have put up. I'll talk about them in a moment. There's a bit of the cemetery which kind of juts out. Uh, it's a rubbish heap now and it's filled with trees and things. Uh, but uh, that is actually appears to be a vault to a family called Talbot. We have no idea what's under there. Uh, and as one day in the future we'd need to have enough volunteers to dig it out to find out what on earth is there. But there's something going on anyway. The other thing is, of course, the trees again. There was a couple of trees along here which had died, which had to be cut out. Those chaps who lived in those houses there were delighted by this because they now have sunlight. But we did want to put things back because this place really needs trees and, and it's very really bright and fitting. So we've had those two put against there and this one here. You can see there's a modern memorial put at the bottom here. This we dedicated yesterday and this is to member uh, Dr. Peter Catamar. He was the chap who initially got me uh, to come in here to record everything. Uh, he died a couple of years ago so we've uh, dedicated this cherry tree to his memory. And so this brings a sort of full circle in terms of uh, the sort of history of the Friends in that it's from this initial spark that I came in here a lot of other people are interested independently and wanted to form the Friends and so we did and we've done an awful lot of work and it's fair to say that this area you couldn't have stood in a few years ago there was quite a few sinkholes Alan one day while working in this area <laughs> fell, in one. fell <laughs> up to his waist in one uh, but you can see it's nice and safe and it, it, it's preserved today you can see there's still a lot of work to do we've still got a lot of memorials which are broken there's still an awful lot of things to be done. Now, uh, in summary, that's a whistle-stop story of what we've been doing, some ideas of what we can do. 